everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this CEE financial aid webinar. My name is Lucas Muratori, and I am an associate here at CEE. I'll be your moderator for today. Uh, this webinar features financial aid expert Mark Kantrowitz, Research Science Institute, class of 1984, publisher and VP of strategy for capex.com, LLC, and CEE trustee. If you think of any questions during the webinar, feel free to use the chat box to submit your questions. If your questions aren't answered, I'll provide Mark's contact information to continue the conversation. The webinar will be recorded, and I'll upload the webinar to CEE's YouTube page after this recording, so you can review the presentation. We appreciate your cooperation and enthusiasm as we enjoy this exciting opportunity. Mark Antrowich is a nationally recognized expert on student financial aid, scholarships, and student loans. His mission is to deliver practical information, advice, and tools to students and their families so they can make informed decisions about planning and paying for college. Without further ado, Mark Kantrowitz. Thank you, Lucas. So we're going to do a overview of financial aid and covering the landscape of financial aid. So you may recognize the big bold letters, don't panic. Uh, financial aid is a incredibly complicated topic, but there aren't that many things that you need to do. Uh, and so the fact that it's got this alphabet soup of acronyms like FAFSA, EFC, and SAR shouldn't intimidate you. And you'll quickly be speaking the lingo. And contrary to what you may have heard, FAFSA is not an acronym for the Frozen at Sea Filet Association. EFC is not a form of electronic funds transfer or eco-friendly cleaning. And a SAR is not a, an infectious disease spread by birds. And what I found over the past several decades is that families worry more about what they don't know than what they do know. They worry that they're going to miss something important that is going to affect their child's future. So I'm here to say, don't panic. I'm going to lay out the landscape of financial aid so that you'll see everything that you need to know. And I'll discuss the most important sources and types of money for college. So this diagram is more than 15 years old. It dates back to 1999. And it illustrates the financial aid delivery system at the time. And at the point is that this is incredibly complicated, too complicated, and it drastically needs to be simplified. But uh, unfortunately, Congress is very good about adding new provisions, not good at sunsetting provisions. So we're going to start with a few of the more common myths. The most, these myths I chose because they are pernicious in some way and they can actually cause harm. The first is known as the unclaimed aid myth, that billions or millions of dollars went unclaimed each year. There, it's usually promoted by a paid scholarship matching service or paid consultant that is trying to convince you to pay the money to tap into this quote unquote unclaimed aid. The most common version of this myth is that $6.6 .6 billion in scholarships went unclaimed last year. That myth is based on a 1976-77 academic year study by the National Institute of Work and Learning, which at the time estimated that $7 billion in employer tuition assistance was potentially available if every employee were to go to school. Uh, and that only 300 to 400 million was being used each year. Uh, you subtract one figure from the other and you get 6.6 .6 billion. You misreported as scholarships, and that's the origin of the myth. Now, it's clear this myth is uh, more than 40 years old. It has nothing to do with scholarships, and the estimates that it presents were not supported by any real evidence. The reality is that almost every scholarship has far more qualified applicants than available funds. There are a handful of scholarships that occasionally go unclaimed. An example is the ZOLP scholarship, Z-O-L-P, which is available at Loyola University of Chicago. It's for students who were born with a last name of ZOLP. 
and the name must appear on both the birth certificate and the christening certificate. You can't change your name to qualify, uh, and it's only tenable at Loyola University. Um, now, there is one form of financial aid that goes unclaimed, and that's the federal Pell Grant, because each year about 2 million students who did not file the FAFSA would have qualified for a federal Pell Grant had they only filed the form. And of them, 1.3 million would have qualified for the maximum federal Pell Grant. So the, the lesson to be learned is you can't get aid if you don't apply. And you should file the FAFSA every single year, even if you got nothing other than loans last year, because the formula can and changes each year and there are very subtle ways uh, that the amount of aid for which you're eligible can change from one year to the next, such as a change in the number of children in college. The second myth is that there's a penalty for savings, so why bother saving? You'll get more financial aid if you don't save. Like many myths, there's an element of truth, but it's not overwhelming. There is a slight penalty for savings. If you save in the parent's name, financial aid will be reduced by at most 5.64% of the net worth of the savings. Now, if you save in the child's name, it's 20%. Uh, you can save in a 529 college savings plan, and it's treated as though it were in the parent's name. Uh, so despite the small penalty, you are still going to be better off if you save. Every $10,000 that you save in the parent's name or in a 529 plan reduces aid eligibility by at most $564, leaving you with $9,436 to pay for college costs. So the more you save, the less you'll have to borrow. Uh, and savings can also expand choice. You might be able to send the child to a more expensive college than you otherwise could afford. And you, it is literally cheaper to save than to borrow. Every dollar you save is a dollar less you're going to have to borrow. Every dollar you borrow will cost about $2 by the time you repay that debt. Now, uh, oftentimes, Parents uh, overestimate eligibility for merit-based aid and underestimate eligibility for need-based aid. Uh, I often hear from parents who think their child is going to win a completely free ride through scholarships. The reality is that only about one in 12 students wins any scholarships, and the average amount per year is about $4,000. The number of students, the percentage of students who win enough money to cover the entire cost of attendance is about uh, 0.3%, probably a little bit less. Um, so scholarships are part of the plan for paying for college, but they're not the entire plan. Now, really talented students may win a lot more scholarships than students who don't have a lot of depth in a particular field. but and you should certainly apply for scholarships, but don't assume that that's all you need to do. And fin the final myth is that we're well too wealthy to qualify for aid, but too poor to afford college. It's kind of a grass is always greener argument. Well, the reality is that everybody struggles to pay for college, but the net price for a low-income student represents a greater share of total family income than for a middle-income student. And for a middle-income student, it's a greater share than for high-income students. And there are some financial aid programs that are targeted at middle-income families, such as the American Opportunity Tax Credit. And financial aid is based on financial need, which is the difference between the total college cost, the cost of attendance figure, and the expected family contribution, the EFC. This is a figure that comes out of the financial aid forms. And thus, there are two ways to increase financial need and therefore need-based financial aid. One is to have a lower EFC, and there are techniques that you can use to try to reduce the EFC or prevent it from being artificially higher. And the other is to increase the cost of attendance. So, wealthy families may nevertheless qualify for need-based aid if they have multiple children in college at the same time, which decreases the EFC, or if they send their children to higher cost colleges, so the cost of attendance is higher. 
either of these will increase the financial need and therefore the financial aid eligibility. Now, I'm going to discuss uh, the major types of financial aid. They are gift aid uh, and self-help aid. Gift aid is money like grants and scholarships and tuition waivers that does not need to be repaid. Self-help aid includes student employment and education loans, which the education loans do have to be repaid, usually with interest. Uh, and student employment can include federal work study or college work study. Uh, which is money that you earn. Grants usually are based on financial need. Examples include the Federal Pell Grant, the Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant, and the TEACH Grant. Now, the TEACH Grant really isn't a grant so much as a forgivable loan. If you don't meet the service requirement, it's retroactively turned into a loan. Scholarships are generally based on some form of merit. It may be academic talent, artistic talent, or athletic talent, or something completely strange like making a prom costume out of duct tape. There really is a scholarship about making a prom costume out of duct tape, and I'll show you some pictures in a bit. Then there's uh, other types of aid like the uh, education tax benefits where you get money back on your federal income tax return based on amounts paid for tuition and textbook costs. These include the American Opportunity Tax Credit, the Lifetime Learning Tax Credit, the Tuition and Fees Deduction, and the Student Loan Interest Deduction. Now, the federal student loans tend to be the cheapest and the most widely available form of education debt. There are also private student loans. And there are loan forgiveness programs like public service loan forgiveness that if you go into particular careers, you might get all or part of your student loans canceled or forgiven. And there's also military student aid. Now, the major sources of financial aid are the federal government, the state governments, the colleges and universities themselves, and sources of private scholarships such as foundations, philanthropists, and corporations. And then there are loans, and then there are employers. Both the parents' employers uh, may have some money to uh, not just help the parents go to school, but some will even have money uh, for dependents of the employee. And then employers may also provide student loan repayment assistance. About 4% of employers do that these days. And um, grants and scholarships make up about uh, 40 to 45% of the total. Now, here's a picture, a set of pictures from the uh, duck brand duct tape stuck at prom competition. And you can see that these costumes, which are made out of duct tape, are incredibly elaborate. I'm told that the winning uh, pair, and each of them wins uh, in a $10,000 scholarship, often spend hundreds of hours putting these costumes together. Uh, and you can go to the stuckatprom.com website to see additional uh, examples and incredibly elaborate and these students are clearly very talented uh, and the key here obviously is that duct tape comes in more colors than just gray. So let's talk about how to apply for financial aid. Basically two methods, one for need-based aid and one for merit-based aid. For the need-based aid you file the FAFSA which is the free application for federal student aid you should file it every year. It, the season opens on October 1st of the senior year in high school and each subsequent year. Uh, and it's used to apply for financial aid from the federal government, state governments, and most colleges and universities. There's an alternate form called the profile that is used by about 200 mostly private colleges for awarding their own financial aid. But uh, they still must use the FAFSA for federal and state aid. And as I said before, you should apply every single year because there are subtle changes that can have a big impact on aid eligibility. And the rules change every single year. The number of children in college can have a big impact on aid eligibility because the parent contribution portion of the expected family contribution is divided by the number of children in college. So if you have two children in college at the same time, 
it's like dividing the parent income in half and dividing the parent assets in half. If you have three children, it's that much better. Uh, and oftentimes I hear from parents who when their eldest goes to college, they don't get anything other than loans. And next year they say, why bother? But then they would have had two children, the eldest and the second eldest in college at the same time and would have qualified for much more financial aid had they only filed the FAFSA. And you should file the FAFSA as soon as possible after October 1st because there are a dozen states that award their financial aid on a first come, first serve basis. And even some forms of federal aid is uh, awarded in a similar manner. So if you file it sooner, you tend to get more financial aid. And you should use the website, which is fafsa.ed.gov, to file the FAFSA. Don't use any copycat website. There is no fee to file the FAFSA, as the name implies, free application. Now, to find scholarships, there are a variety of free scholarship matching databases. I've listed the one that's provided by my website, capex.com. Uh, and there is also FastWeb, Peterson's, and the College Board have databases. You might want to search two of the databases because they all overlap to a very significant degree. And that way you will ensure that you get all the scholarships, you find all the scholarships for which you are eligible. And you should start searching immediately. As soon as this talk is over, start searching because there are scholarships you can win in younger grades. There are scholarships that are available in the fall with fall deadlines that if you wait until the spring, like many families do, to start figuring out how you're going to pay for college, well, you have missed half of the deadlines in the senior year. And you should continue searching even after you're already enrolled in college because there are some scholarships that are available only to students who are already enrolled in college. And clearly, you need to apply for both types of aid to have a chance of getting it. And you can't get money if you don't apply. Now, if you have problems completing the FAFSA, uh, there are a variety of free sources of information. Uh, the federal government has a contractor who runs the Federal Student Aid Information Center to answer questions about the FAFSA and also questions about federal student aid. And it's easy to remember, it's 1-800-4-FED-AID or in digits 1-800-433-3243. And they also run occasional Twitter chats uh, using the Ask FAFSA hashtag and it comes out of the at FAFSA Twitter account, which is run by the US Department of Education. There's also a program called College Goals Sunday, which is run by many states. Uh, they usually have the programs in the evenings and weekends uh, for the first three months of the FAFSA application season. And these are where events where volunteers provide one-on-one -on -one help completing the FAFSA. And you will actually complete the entire form there um, with someone to help answer your questions. And uh, it's part of a campaign from the National College Access Network called Form Your Future. And you visit the website formyourfuture.org, scroll down to the bottom, and you'll see a uh, menu item where you can specify your state and see the programs that are available in your state. There is a book that I wrote originally called Filing the FAFSA. It is available for free at advisors.com slash FAFSA hyphen book. Uh, they no longer do a print version of it. It's just online. Um, so you can get a lot of information there. Also on capex.com, we have over 50 web pages on our, uh, in our articles and advice section of our site devoted to the FAFSA. And pretty much every question you can think of is answered by one of those articles. Uh, and you can also ask your guidance counselor or the financial aid administrator at a nearby college for help. So now let's talk about some strategies for increasing your eligibility for need-based aid by decreasing the EFC. Now the FAFSA uses information from the prior, prior year. So two-year-old income information 
because by the time the FAFSA starts, October 1st, most people will have already filed the prior prior year's federal income tax return. The due date is April 15. Sometimes it's April 16 or 17, and years when that occurs on a weekend. But if you get an extension, the automatic extension is six months, so that would be October 15. So by the start of the FAFSA season, most people, even those who have gotten an extension, will have filed their federal income tax return. And there is a tool that lets you transfer information from the federal income tax return into the FAFSA. It's called the IRS Data Retrieval Tool. And that makes it a lot easier. Now, first strategy is you want to be careful about income during that base year and also subsequent years because each you file a FAFSA every year as opposed to one FAFSA at the start. So you don't want to artificially increase your income during that base year. For example, don't realize capital gains that year, or if you do, try to offset them with losses because that increases your income, which increases the EFC and reduces your aid eligibility. If you're going to get a bonus that year, try to defer it until the child's, uh, no, it will no longer affect their aid eligibility. Uh, and you can do that if you defer it for two years, that should be enough unless the child's going on to graduate school. And uh, also avoid retirement plan distributions because those count as income on the FAFSA, as does current year contributions. And even though they don't show up as adjusted gross income on your federal income tax return, they get added back in when the FAFSA calculates total income and therefore affect aid eligibility. You can try reducing your, your reportable assets. So you could pay off consumer debt like credit cards, auto loans, and mortgages because that debt is ignored by the federal financial aid formula. Um, so if you pay it down, you take an asset that is reportable like money in the bank and you make it disappear. Um, also, if you have um, retirement plan contributions, as I said before, it won't affect income, but it does affect assets. So if you continue to make retirement plan contributions, you will reduce your reportable assets. The financial aid formulas are much more dependent on cash flow and income than they are on assets. But still, I, you may have situations where uh, reportable assets can have an impact. Uh, and someone approaches you about setting up a trust fund, almost every trust fund is going to backfire. Uh, and it will not help you eliminate aid eligibility. Also beware of people who want you to uh, sell your home and put the assets into uh, a life insurance policy or annuity. Uh, usually this is benefiting them much more so than it's benefiting you. Should save strategically, as I mentioned before, savings in the child name reduce aid eligibility by a fifth, 20% whereas assets in the parent's name, worst case scenario, it's 5.64%. Uh, 529 plans are a great way of doing this. If it's owned by the student or the parent, it's treated as though it were a parent asset on the FAFSA, and uh, that's that 5.64%, and distributions don't count against you. If it's owned by anybody else, it's not reported as an asset, but the distributions will reduce aid eligibility by as much as half of the distribution amount. And within 529 plans, the key to maximizing your net returns is to minimize the cost. Look for a state plan, and you can invest in any state's plan, where the costs are less than 1%, ideally less than half a percent. Also look in your own state's plan, because about 35 states uh, will uh, let you deduct uh, contributions to the state's plan on your federal income tax return. That matters more when the child uh, enters high school, whereas in the earlier years, it mattered, the fees matter more. Uh, so grandparents who are saving for their grandchild's college education should contribute to a parent-owned 529 plan and not set up their own because that will hurt aid eligibility. And if you saved in an UGMA or UTMA account, 
you can roll that over into a custodial 529 plan account, which will be owned by the student and the student will also be the beneficiary. And that will be treated, however, as though it were owned by the parent on the FAFSA. We already talked about maximizing the number of children in college at the same time. Uh, there are some colleges that are more generous than others. What you want to do is look at the net price, and I'll discuss that in a little, little bit, uh, to identify the colleges that, yield, that will provide a lower bottom line cost to you than others. It's not necessarily the colleges with the biggest grants, because those tend to be the colleges with the biggest cost, but an in-state public college or one of these no loans financial aid policy, colleges with the no loans policy will be your best bet. Don't miss the deadlines. File the FAFSA as soon as possible. Start searching for scholarships as soon as possible. And then let's talk a little bit about appealing for more aid. Unfortunately, a lot of families do not appeal for more aid, even when they would be justified in receiving it. So if you have any unusual circumstances, such as a change from that base year to the present, or anything that distinguishes you from the typical family. So an example could be job loss or salary reduction, or if you have high unreimbursed medical or dental expenses, you have a special needs child with high dependent care costs, or maybe an elderly parent that you're supporting, or if the parents themselves are going to be going back to college to get a degree, maybe a master's or a PhD, uh, you can appeal for more aid on that basis because normally parents don't count in that number in, of children in college figure because there used to be a lot of abuse where parents were going back to school to get an associate's degree. You know, these were parents who had PhDs uh, and they were doing it solely to uh, qualify for more financial aid. And then th there can also be uh, event in unusual circumstances like a one-time event that is not reflective of the family's ability to pay during the academic year. Like you got uh, a big bonus or an inheritance that was not under your control uh, and that artificially inflated your income, you can appeal and sometimes the colleges will make an adjustment. If something occurs in the middle of the school year, say uh, one of the parents is laid off from their job, you can appeal in the middle of the school year and the colleges do have contingency funds to handle uh, such mid-year changes. And this process is going to be driven by documentation. Provide independent third-party documentation of the unusual circumstance and its financial impact on the family. Uh, and then the colleges will review that documentation uh, and they will make adjustments if they feel that it merits an adjustment. And the financial impact is what is going to drive the amount of that adjustment. They make adjust changes to the financial data elements that are on the FAFSA to re reflect this and they can do that, you can't. And they will um, that will cause a new EFC which will cause more financial aid. Uh, now, in general, this is a subjective process by the colleges. The college financial aid administrators will tend to be more likely to make an adjustment when these unusual or special circumstances are caused by factors that are beyond the family's control. So I've seen cases where if the a student quits a job, I mean, let's say an independent student quits a job to go to school full time, I've seen some colleges that will not make an adjustment, even though realistically the, that student has less money available. Now let's talk about searching for scholarships. Um, I mentioned capex.com slash scholarships. Uh, there's also FastWeb, College Board, Big Future, Peterson's. These are all good quality free scholarship matching services. Never pay money to search a scholarship database. The paid databases aren't better. In fact, they're usually worse because they don't update as frequently. Uh, and you need to start searching as soon as possible. Uh, there are uh, some scholarships that are really nice. Uh, these $25,000 scholarships or more 
uh, examples like, like the Regeneron Science Talent Search is over a hundred thousand um, dollars and uh, there's a variety of these a few dozen of these but most scholarships are going to be for a few hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars and while an individual scholarship may not make a big difference and every dollar you win is a dollar less you're going to have to borrow and that is going to save you uh, some money uh, and they do add up um, and you, if you win a few $500 scholarships, you may actually have a few thousand dollars that you've saved. And when using any free scholarship matching service, try to answer all the optional questions in addition to the required questions. Students who do this on average will match twice as many scholarships as students who complete only the required questions. And there's an element of luck, not just skill, in who wins a scholarship because it's very hard to distinguish between the finalists. So the more scholarships you apply to, the greater your chances are of winning one. And just because there are online scholarship databases doesn't mean you should ignore the offline world. Uh, typically, there will be a bulletin board outside the school counselor's office at your high school, uh, the financial aid office at the colleges, uh, your local public library in the jobs and careers section may have a bulletin board. And this is where you'll find small local awards that don't want to be listed in any of these large databases. Could be a PTA scholarship or dollars for scholars scholarship. And those scholarships will also be less competitive because fewer students will be applying. If you're going to use a scholarship listing book, which are great tools for random exploration, whereas the online services are more of a targeted matching process, check the copyright date of the book before you rely on it. If it's more than a year or two old, it's too old to be useful because each year about 10% of the scholarships will change in some material way. And uh, the copyright date uh, is usually the date of publication, um, but many books get locked in uh, as early as a year before the ultimate publication date. So if it's two years old, that's three years, you may have a third of the book being obsolete. You should apply to every scholarship for which you're eligible. Uh, as I said, it's a matter of luck, not just skill. But obviously, you shouldn't apply for a scholarship if you're not eligible for it. Um, Students have a tendency to not want to apply for scholarships that have small dollar amounts or involve writing an essay. Um, and those tend to be less competitive and easier to win as a result. And if you have trouble writing essays, uh, answer the question out loud while recording yourself, then transcribe the recording. This will yield a more passionate uh, essay and a more effective essay, in part because people write or type at 30 to 60 words a minute, but they speak at about 200 words a minute. So the act of writing interferes with the flow of thought. When you record yourself, you will, if it's a 300 word essay, 200 words a minute, that's a minute and a half to get enough material for that essay. And oftentimes you'll speak for several minutes and then you'll have to cut back on well, there might be some repetition uh, and that yields a much more powerful essay but always read the directions and follow them uh, if you don't follow the directions it's a way that they thin out the number of applications they receive because the scholarship providers usually receive far too many applications so if they say 300 words and you write 301 words they will toss your application because you, uh, you didn't follow directions. And you may be the best possible candidate, but because you didn't follow the directions, you lose out on that money. Because they're going to want you, when you win a scholarship, they may want you to send an annual report to keep your scholarship in subsequent years. They may want you to send them grade reports, uh, or they may want you to participate in volunteer activities. Uh, and nothing bothers them more than a student who doesn't follow those directions. 
So if you can't follow the directions on the application, you might not follow the directions later that are needed to keep your award. And when scholarship providers evaluate applications, the, they're evaluating you based on the words you write. And if you've got an essay that has spelling and grammatical errors, uh, it's going to give a bad impression. So print it out so it looks different and look through it uh, and maybe have a parent or a teacher also proofread it. Uh, great practice for college admissions essays as well. Uh, and also the reading out loud technique can also work for proofreading. Read out the essay out loud. Anytime you stumble, mark an X at that point and then go back later and you'll find there might be a, a logical error, there might be a spelling error or a grammar error, lexical choice might be off and there will be something that you can fix. And then repeatedly do this until you can read the essay out loud without making any stumbling. Um, and you also should Google yourself. See, because about a quarter of the scholarship providers are now doing that. They may um, require finalists to friend them on Facebook. And partly they're doing this to see how you interact in a real environment, but they're also looking for red flags. If there is something uh, wrong, um, you are going to be representing the scholarship provider. You'll reflect on them. And so if there are pictures of inappropriate behavior or bad attitudes online, it's going to hurt your ability to win the scholarship. And you can delete things from your Facebook wall and delete old tweets, uh, and that will um, prevent this from causing you to lose a scholarship that you otherwise could win. I uh, mentioned that there are scholarships that you can win in younger grades, um, even in an elementary school. And here's a list of a few. We have a more comprehensive list on uh, CapEx, um, Doodle for Google, National Spelling Bee. If, if, if I ask you to make a list of scholarships for younger kids, um, you will not include the National Spelling Bee in that list, even though it's a major scholarship competition. It's one that when told, people in 2020 hindsight say, oh yes, that's a major scholarship competition. But if you ask them to name scholarships for younger kids, they don't include it in the list. It's kind of interesting. Um, unfortunately, there was one that was one of my favorites. It was the GIF Most Creative Sandwich Contest, which had a $25,000 top prize. Unfortunately, they uh, the GIF peanut butter discontinued it in 2016. It's an example of one of these scholarships that changes in some material way. It's no longer being given. One that I see a lot um, is the Orville Redenbacher Second Start Scholarship, which was over a decade ago. It was just a one-year competition, but it's still on a lot of websites. One thing to be careful about is scholarship scams. If you have to pay money to get money, it's probably a scam. Uh, never invest more than a postage stamp to get information about a scholarship or to apply for a scholarship. And the, a scholarship is about giving out money. It's not about getting money. And there are some scams that operate effectively on a for-profit basis. May, they may even give out a few scholarships, but they're mostly collecting application fees. And they may seem innocuous, like $3, but if you have 100,000 applicants at $3, that's $300,000 they are taking in a lot of money. If there's any kind of a guarantee attached, it's a scam. It's a, a guarantee that you'll win a scholarship is on its face fraudulent. There was a federal case where a scholarship scam was shut down based on that information. Also be careful about personally identifiable information. Key uh, identifiers like your social security number that may be uh, used for identity theft also, bank account numbers can be used to empty your bank account with something called a demand draft. They don't need your signature in order to do so. All they need is the bank account number and the routing number from a check. And they can usually find the routing numbers online. So if someone asks for your bank account number, don't give it to them, hang up. So only credit card numbers. And if someone says you have to pay a fee to get a student loan, Ignore it. 
because that's called an advance fee loan scam and fees in advance upfront fees are illegal for um, improving uh, in changing fixing problems with the loan and all the legitimate loans federal loans private student loans do not charge upfront fees they always deduct the fee from the disbursement check uh, in the introduction I mentioned education tax benefits like the American Opportunity Tax Credit and these provide money on your federal income tax return based on amounts that you spent on tuition and textbooks and there are three overlapping education tax benefits American Opportunity Lifetime Learning and Tuition and Fees Deduction you can only use one of them per student and uh, the lifetime learning is actually in, per taxpayer not just per student Generally, if you qualify for the American Opportunity Tax Credit, uh, it uh, is your best tax credit. It will yield the most money. Uh, the Lifetime Learning Tax Credit is mostly used by graduate and continuing education students who are no longer eligible for the American Opportunity Tax Credit because there's a four-year limit to the AOTC. There's also a student loan deduction and other exclusions from income. Um, up to uh, $5,250 in employer paid tuition assistance can be excluded from income. A good resource is IRS publication 970, um, which uh, if you just search for publication 970 on irs.gov, you'll find it. Now, when you're comparing different colleges, you should use what's called the net price. And the net price is kind of like a discounted sticker price. It's the amount that's left after the total college costs have the gift aid, the grants and scholarships, and other money that doesn't need to be repaid subtracted from them. The net price is the amount that you're going to have to pay from your savings, from contribution from current income, and contribution from future income in the form of loans to cover the college costs. And that's a better way to compare two different colleges. So even though at a higher cost college you may have greater financial need, the extra aid that you get may be more loans than grants. So you need to focus on what is the discounted sticker price after you subtract the grants to see what your bottom line cost will be for the different colleges. If the difference in the net price is less than $1,000, then the cost doesn't really matter. If it's more than $5,000, most families will go with the less expensive college, and in between, they agonize over the decision. Now, by law, since 2011, every college has had to have a net price calculator on its website that lets you get a personalized estimate. It's kind of in the ballpark. It should be within about $500 of the actual figure. And you can play what-if games. You can say, what if we have two children in college at the same time? How does that affect the net price? Now, there's a lot of variability in accuracy. Uh, the more questions a net price calculator has, the more accurate it will be. Some of these calculators use two-year-old data. Some use up-to-date data. Um, and some of them do something that is misleading that I think should be banned, but is not yet banned by federal law. And that's they add a net cost to the net price. So they'll have the net price as required by law, but then the, the last figure on the page as their bottom line cost will be a net cost that not only subtracts the gift aid, but also subtracts loans. The problem with that is loans have to be repaid and usually with interest. So it's not really your bottom line cost. And your bottom line cost is only involves subtracting the gift aid, the grants and scholarships. And uh, many colleges are going to have a difference in the net price because different colleges have different amount of grants. Uh, but the net cost figure, which subtracts the loans, well, they tend to all have a similar net cost because the that net cost is going to be close to the EFC, the expected family contribution. Okay. And you will find that a net price uh, is very 
good correlation with debt at graduation. It's also going to be lower at in-state public colleges because they tend to have the lowest costs, even though they don't have as much financial aid and they have tuition that is half to a third of the cost at a private nonprofit college. So even with no aid, it's still going to be your least expensive option. There are also uh, 74 colleges that have no loans financial aid policies where they don't use loans in the financial aid package, just grants. And so those tend to be among the most generous and have the lowest net price. Princeton University, for example, which was the college that started this in the late 1990s, they have uh, an average debt at graduation among those who borrow that is around $8,000. Uh, there are uh, two caveats that I should mention about the net price. Uh, one is that some colleges practice front loaning of grants where you get a better mix of grants versus loans your first year uh, than in subsequent years. So your net price will go up in subsequent years at these colleges. Uh, also, if you've won a lot of scholarships, many colleges practice scholarship displacement um, where they reduce your financial aid package by the amount of that private scholarship that you just won. Now they have a choice in how they do this. They could reduce loans, in which case your net price goes down or they could reduce their own grants, in which case you have no net financial gain. So you need to understand, if you have a lot of scholarships, you need to understand what the college's outside scholarship policy or scholarship displacement policy says. Um, now, when you're trying to figure out just how affordable a college is, net price is a good first uh, step. Um, you can compare your family's resources with that net price. Now, you, what you really want to do is compare it with a four-year net price. Now, if the college practice is front-loading grants, you need to take that into account. But your resources are your savings, your income, and reasonable debt. Um, and you, if you take that total and compare it with the four-year net price, if that resources exceeds the net price, then you can afford that college. If the cost and if that net price exceeds your resources, then you'll be forced to borrow excessively in order to pay for that college education. Uh, and as far as reasonable and affordable debt, if your total debt at graduation is less than your annual starting salary, then you can afford to repay those student loans in 10 years or less. And a similar rule applies to the parents. The parent plus loans or parent loans that the parents borrow to help their children uh, for all their children should be no more than their annual income. And that assumes that retirement is at least 10 years away. If retirement's only five years away, you should borrow half as much. The uh, other measure of college affordability is something I call the college, affordability, the college affordability index, which is the ratio of the net price to total family income. And that includes not just your adjusted gross income, but also untaxed income and benefits. And this is obviously focused on your cash flow. Um, so it's just a one year figure, but if the college affordability index is less than 25%, the college is affordable. It's kind of a, a rough way of uh, ranking colleges based on affordability. One thing to be aware of though, is that sometimes it takes more than four years to graduate, depending on prerequisites, or maybe you're in an, an, in an engineering program that requires five years. So you may have a greater for, a full cost of education over five years than you would over four years. Generally speaking, even if uh, graduation takes five years and an in-state public college, it will be cheaper than most private nonprofit colleges uh, involving four years of education. So I already talked about reasonable and affordable debt. Uh, if you're total student loan debt exceeds your annual starting salary, you're going to struggle to make those loan payments in 10 years. And so what you'll need is an alternate repayment plan like extended repayment or income driven repayment, which will reduce the monthly payments by stretching out the term of the loan. And that means that you, instead of 10 years in repayment, you might be in 
repayment for 20, 25, or even 30 years. And that means you will still be repaying your own student loans when your children go to college. That's not an ideal situation. So if you are trying to borrow smart, you should always borrow federal first because the federal student loans are cheaper, more available, and have better repayment terms. And they generally don't require a cosigner, while private student loans do. Uh, more than 90% of private student loans to undergraduate students require a creditworthy cosigner, which is usually the parent. Uh, and a cosigner is a co borrower, equally obligated to repay the debt. If a parent cosigns a loan for a child and that child defaults on the loan, it's going to ruin the parent's credit, not just the child's. And as soon as that child is late with a payment, the lender is going to seek repayment through the parent. Um, they could do it from the start, but it's and as a courtesy, they let the student be the first to repay. But as soon as that student stops making on-time payments, they're going to contact the parents and ask the parents to start making payments. There are some significant differences between federal student loans and private student loans. Federal student loans have significantly better repayment plans and better protections like death and disability discharges. Private student loans, only about half of them have death and disability discharges. And there are more options if you encounter financial difficulty. And nobody plans on running into financial trouble, but people do, and the federal protections are much better than those on private student loans. And for example, the federal student loans have income-driven repayment plans. All but one of the private student loans do not. And loan forgiveness is just for federal loans. So if you're intending to go into teaching or an other public interest field, like public interest law, for example, borrowing federal is going to be better than borrowing private. And generally, the interest rates on the federal Stafford loans for undergraduate and graduate students are less expensive than the best private student loans. The only case in which private loans may be less expensive is when you're comparing them with the Parent PLUS loans. If the parents have excellent credit, uh, they may actually have an interest rate that is half a percent to a percentage point lower, and they typically have no fees, whereas a Federal Parent PLUS loan has fees over 4%. So if you want to cut your borrowing costs, um, you should try uh, taking advantage of all the free money first, so scholarships, savings, that's uh, money that doesn't need to be repaid. Uh, as a reasonable alternative to long-term debt, many colleges offer tuition installment plans, which break up that college bill into equal monthly installments over the course of less than a year. They don't charge interest, but they do charge an upfront fee of typically less than $100. Um, if you can pay the bill, but just not in one big lump sum, it's a good alternative. And in general, um, try to economize on the living expenses. And first thing you should do is consider the cost of the institution. But then there's room and board, textbooks, transportation, and other costs. Uh, and it's very easy for this to add up. And if you don't like the cafeteria food and you eat out once a week, let's say it's a $10 pizza a week, over the course of a four-year college career, that's $2,000 that you're spending on pizza. And if you're using student loan money to pay for it, every dollar you borrow will cost $2 by the time you pay back that debt. Uh, and so that will be $4,000. That's a lot of pizza. And it might not be pizza, it might be that you have a coffee habit or you buy beverages from vending machines, but it does add up. So live like a student while you're in school so you don't have to live like a student after you graduate. And as I alluded to earlier, you can cut college costs by attending a less expensive college such as an in-state public college or one of these elite no loans colleges and the in-state public colleges give you about as good quality education, sometimes better than private nonprofit colleges, uh, at half to a third the cost. So even if you get no financial aid at these schools, you will be saving money. 
And students who graduate from undergraduate school with no debt are twice as likely to go on to graduate school as students who uh, graduate with some debt. So uh, other tips for cutting college costs, you could graduate in three years instead of four or more realistically, four years instead of five. Uh, you could do what I did, which is I double majored and got two degrees for the price of one. Doesn't really save money, but it gets me twice as many degrees. Um, and the interesting thing is full-time enrollment is considered 12 credits per semester. Uh, you cannot graduate in four years at 12 credits a semester. You need to actually be taking 15 credits a semester to graduate in four years. So you should make sure you're doing enough class, taking enough classes each term so that you can graduate on time. You should plan a path from matriculation to completion so that you are aware of when each class is offered, what the prerequisite structure is, so that you don't end up in one of these uh, problems where you've backed yourself into a corner where you need a class in order to take another class, but the class you need isn't offered this semester, it's offered next semester. That, for, that causes a one semester delay. Uh, also, before enrolling in college, you can get college credits through AP tests, uh, international baccalaureate tests, as well as CLEP and PEP. Um, and those, uh, and most colleges will require a four or five on that. Sometimes it won't satisfy a prerequisite, but it'll be general credit. But still, that, that can help you graduate on time. I alluded to uh, saving on textbook costs. You can buy used textbooks from the bookstore or online websites, or you can sell them back to the bookstore at the end of the term, or you can do both, and that will save you around the half of the, the textbook costs, which can add up. Um, textbook costs uh, and books, book supplies and equipment often uh, cost anywhere from one to $2,000 a year. Uh, don't believe a college if it says that your textbook costs are only a few hundred dollars uh, a year. Um, that is not a realistic figure, unless that college has a special program where they're bundling the cost of the textbooks into the cost of tuition. And then uh, you could also, um, if you are going to school close to home, you could live at home. There is an aspect to the college experience that you only get if you're living on campus. I mean, a lot of the education is not sitting in a classroom listening to lectures. It is learning from your peers, studying for uh, tests, um, working together on problem sets, uh, and also in formal sentence. You learn as much from your peers as you do from the college professors. So uh, thank you. Um, and you can follow me on Twitter. I post a lot of the articles that I write to my Twitter account. So whenever I have a new article, you can find it there. And you can also visit CapEx.com. Uh, we will have over a thousand articles by the end of this year on that website. And we're continuing to write new articles of interest to students and parents uh, every single day. All right, thank you so much, Mark, uh, for providing some detailed information about financial aid. Uh, I want to thank all of the CE parents and CE alumni who joined us today. Uh, we hope that you're able to take something away from this. And remember, I'll be reaching out to all of you to hear your feedback and provide the link to the recording of the webinar so you can watch it again if you want. On behalf of CEE, thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to collaborating with you on future opportunities. Please don't hesitate to contact me with any questions. Have a great rest of your day.